That's what we just saw in the debugger. You can see that these things get resolved, but unresolved ones still point at stuff code within the module. All right, and then just, let's see. I don't know if I even have this on the desktop. This is just a miscellaneous tool for your own purposes to kind of, if you ever feel like seeing like what does the module really completely depend on, uh, there's a tool called the depend, uh, dependency walker which will show you every module this thing imports and every module those import and every module they import, etc. So I'm just going to grab that quick because I don't think I have it downloaded. So, if I run depends.exe and I open something like Notepad or MS Paint, which we know has a delayed load module, but I see colon Windows. So at the first level, something like depends.exe will just, it's basically looking at the import structures for Notepad, for MS Paint, right? It's saying MS Paint imports through normal imports, you know, MFC42U, MSVCRT, blah, blah, blah. So each of these is like a normal import. And if you want, you can then drill down and say, okay, well, what does MFC42U import? And then that'll show you all the things it imports, and you can see all the things those imports, et cetera. So you, you can just keep drilling down. Normal imports are just these regular boxes there. Delayed imports are these things that have the little hourglass next to them. So they're saying at some future time, this GDI and UX theme will be imported, right? And so actually, if we click on one of them, like UX theme, we can see these are the functions which it imported, right? We saw there were only three imports from UX theme. And so these will be imported just in time. And actually, it'll also tell you, here's all the exports for UX theme, right? So we haven't seen the exports yet, but of course I said there's going to be just some big array that says here's all the different things I export. And then there is one other, so we've seen delayed imports, bound imports, and normal imports. Um, what was I looking for? Forwarded imports? Yeah. Forwarded exports. Okay, I'll just, uh, say this, but we haven't got to it yet. No, I'm not going to even say it. We'll come back to that. So there is another kind of quasi-import that only has relevance when we know about exports. So that was just a quick thing to say, like, if you ever feel like browsing something in an import and export uh, specific sort of fashion, you can use something like depends.exe to go walk through and see everything that's imported and exported all the way down the line in terms of prerequisites. So you can expect that all of those things are going to be in the module address space. That's the delay loaded ones, which may only be added at some point later. All right, so this is the thing I wanted to say before I told you what that blob of code that gets stuck in by the linker is. So there are two functions which you should know about because, I mean, one, because this is how the delayed imports is actually implemented, and two, because malware makes use of these functions a lot. Uh, their load library and get proc address. So these are actually functions the system gives you in order to load library. That brings the DLL off a disk. You just say load library user32.dll and it loads it into your current process address space. Get proc address then, you take a handle given to you by load library and you pass it into get proc address and you say for this module, user32.dll, call get proc address and say, you know, I want function whatever. Well, let's say it was Let's say I called load library ntdll, and then I called get proc address on nt query system information, right? That's what we did before in the import address table hooking thing. So you would call load library to get 
NTDLL, and then you call get proc address to get back the function address, the absolute virtual address of NT query system information. And so now if you go back and you look at that import address table lab, you'll see that actually how they got the original address for NT query system information is they called, you know, just in one big line, they called uh, load library NTDLL, get proc address, NT query system information. So the other thing to say then is, um, so now that you know the existence of these things, I can say that if I were to go back and step through that um, MS Paint example quick, you don't have to follow along here, but eventually in that MS Paint example, you know, we just stepped over a function and like magically somehow all the code inside of that eventually filled in the function pointer thing. If I step into that function a bit and I keep stepping into different things that it calls, eventually I'll see that it calls load library and eventually I'll see that it actually calls get proc address. So that's all it's using. It just, the linker says if you're going to use delayed imports, it's going to put in a blob of code which will call load library and get proc address for you and that's how it'll do the delayed load. So just quickly here, open up MS Paint again. And actually, since I saw that that second thing actually gets loaded before uh, the first one, I'm going to set a breakpoint there because I know that's the first thing and that therefore, if I set a breakpoint there, uxtheme.dll should not actually be loaded at that point. So copy that, breakpoint that. All right, so that one gets hit very early, and we see some subcode as before. All right, subcode just takes the address, you know, 103E6C8, because it's not this first one. And so we're going to step into that, step into that, in, 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 in. All right, and I'm just going to keep stepping until we find some calls to some functions. There we go. So I just kept stepping in and I said, you know, I just keep wanting to follow jumps and I want to follow calls and stuff like that. And eventually, by just stepping in, I got to kernel32.dll uh, load library A, which is just the ASCII version. So eventually, this subcode is going to call load library. That's going to pull in UX theme. Now, if I step out of this, there's this little step out arrow there, which says just run until load library is done. Let's see if it actually says it down here. All right, so that call right there, that was a call to uh, load library. And you know what? Actually, this right here, that's probably like the import address table. Let's check. 1260 RVA. One, two, Six zero. There we go. So it called the import address table to get load library, and then it went and delay loaded the UX theme. So that's why I couldn't see like right here. It didn't say you know call load library or something like that. It's calling into its import address table into uh, UX theme. I mean, some things like Ida would probably figure that out for you. They would say you're calling to uh, load library, but now, I'm guessing this right here, this 11C0, guessing that's get proc address. And we just took the return address from load library and we're going to pass it to get proc address. But actually, we got this jump there, so maybe not. Let's see. Well, let's check first. 11C0, back in the import address table. 11C0, get last error. Okay. That makes sense. Just checking if there's, you know, an error. But if there's no error, so it's going to say it's going to test, take EAX, put it into EDI, test EDI, and then jump if not zero, jump if not equal. So it's going to jump over that get last error. So it's saying, you know, if there's no error, I don't need to call get last error. So step, 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 jump over the call. Now let's see if this one's get proc address. 1268. 1268. 
and then get fructose. Ah, interlocked exchange. So it's setting some mutex. We can do this. I'll just step over that one. I don't care about my mutex. Oh, here we go. We're pushing some stuff and then we're calling. All right, 1111C, or sorry, 11CC. Ta da! Get proc address. Okay, we found get proc address. So I have proved my assertion that the stub code eventually calls load library to load up a DLL, get proc address, to resolve an address. And actually, if we stop immediately before we call and we look at the values on the stack, we're probably going to see one of them is the passed in string of. Uh, of the name of the function we're trying to import, or trying to resolve, rather. So let's see, I am right here right now. And if I look at the stack, pull up another memory window. I look at the top of the stack as the words. I'm going to guess that one right there is the string, like so. There we go, open theme data. So I got. A pointer to the string open theme data on the top of the stack. And if I go back and look at the delay load imports for this function, the second one there is open theme data, right? So it's all just an elaborate ruse to call load library and get proc address. Now, I said that those are used by um, malware as well. So when malware uses it, it's frequently in order to obfuscate what functions they actually import. And therefore, the, the notion is, if I can look at the import address table for some malware, and I see functions like, you know, open socket or, you know, query registry value and stuff like that, I've got an initial idea about what the malware is doing, right? It has network connectivity, and it's modifying the registry and stuff like that. So what malware will do is they will only import something like get proc address and load library. And then they have some strings, you know, pseudo encrypted somewhere within the file, right? They've, you know, XORed out the strings, so you can't just run strings on the binary. And so then all they do is their code just initially runs load library on whatever, you know, kernel 32.dll that they want to pull in, ntdll. And then they just import each function that they want by using get proc address. And so ultimately they'll still have the same functionality. It just won't have been done for them by the operating system. They'll do it themselves manually. And that's a way to sort of hide from initial analysis what, uh, what functions are being used. And actually, that's also done when something hopefully will, as long as I keep moving along here at a, at a rapid clip, we'll get to the packing lab today and we'll, we'll go through uh, unpacking some very simple un uh, packer like UPX and you'll see how uh, potentially it is using something like, so, well, I'm not going to jump in. So, Hackers and things like that will use uh, get load library and get proc address in order to resolve function point. Resolve function pointers that could not have possibly been resolved at load time because at load time the code was the packer code and all of your real code was compressed into a blob inside the pack thing. So, all right. Yep. So right here, this this last thing is just saying that it's used by malware in order to hide it so that. They're not going to have all of the import names tables saying all the functions they resolve, all the functions they use. They'll just resolve them themselves manually. So finally done to imports. Treat yourself to some fail, but unfortunately it's not time for a break. So make it quick, and then we will continue on. So on to exports. Right? So the whole point of having a library, something like a DLL, is that you're trying to export common functions that other executables can use, right? You're saying, I want to put this code in one place, and then that code can find it, and that code can find it, and I'm going to be exporting this function, you know, draw theme or open theme data, whatever, NT query system information. I'm going to be exporting this function from my module, and I want other uh, modules to come and just use this single version of the uh, function. So the thing we have to know about here, and we already made reference to it a little bit, there's two ways you can export functions. You can export by name and you can export by ordinal. So before when we were talking about that hint and string, right, I said that hint is an ordinal. So when you're exporting by name, you're saying like here, here's a function I'm exporting. It's called 
you know, NT query system information. When you're exporting by ordinal, there's not going to be any string in your export table that we're going to talk about. There's not going to be any string that says, like, here's NT query information. There's only going to be a number that says, if you want to call this function, you better ask for number, you know, five in my export table. And so some things like the Winsock, um, I think it's WS2 underscore 32.dll, something like that. The Windows socket library has a bunch of functions that will export only by ordinal. And so there will be functions which you can call, but you have to know specifically what function you're trying to call. And so one reason you could think that someone might do that is because they don't actually want you calling the function unless you know what you're doing. So there's a variety of reasons why you would, might want to do ordinal based export. So, like I said, the ordinal is really just an index into some array of, like, exported functions. So, we're going to see conceptually, you know, so I've said conceptually a module has just a big array that says, here's my export one, here's my export two, here's my export three. And they may have a name attached to them, they may not. But, uh, but ultimately, I don't know what I was going for. I forgot. Back in the data directory, index zero of the data directory is pointing at the metadata for exports. So we saw index one was all this blob right here for imports. Index zero is this chunk over here, which is for exports. As usual, it is just a virtual size. It's just an RVA, virtual address, an RVA saying where the in export information starts and then a size saying how big it is. So if we follow that RVA, where we end up is right here at an image export directory. And then attached to this are sort of three different arrays dealing with the functions that are being exported right now. So in terms of what we care about, uh, we've got eight-ish things right here. So now, this is where I fill in the lie that I told on the time date stamp with respect to bound imports. I said that, you know, the OS loader just goes and looks at the time date stamp in the file header for, you know, the module which is bound against. But in reality, there's an actual time date stamp for the exports. And so, who was it yesterday who asked about, like, was it you, David, about whether you can trick and, like, not change the time date stamp in order to, like, not s specify that the exports have changed? Or No? Okay. I don't remember who asked it, but uh, the point here is this time date stamp can be separate from the file header time date stamp. And so, because this is the one that's actually checked versus the, this is the one that's actually checked against by the OS loader when it's walking around and saying, you know, do I need to fix any of these bound imports? Do I need to fix the bound imports? Since it checks this one, if you recompile your executable, but nothing has changed about your exports, they're all still at the same offset, and they're all still the same ordinal numbers and stuff like that. If nothing has changed about what you're exporting, this time date stamp can stay the same, even though the time date stamp in the file header has been updated because you recompiled it. So, yeah, basically the point here is this is the one which is actually checked about, checked against for bound imports. Yep, and I guess NTDLL is an example we could show where the uh, time date stamp is different. Why did I say wasn't able to confirm if I'm saying C NTDLL? Let's see NTDLL quick. Yeah, so here's an example, NTDLL, where the time date stamp, here it says 499, blah, blah, blah. But in the actual export directory, in this time date stamp field, we have 498 something. So you can see the time date stamp is older here. It's 2009-206, and it's newer for overall, so 2009-209. So it was actually compiled three days later, and nothing actually changed in the exports, and therefore, uh, the time date stamp here was updated, but the time date stamp here was not updated. So, yeah, cross that out. Well, no, I guess I don't really have a confirmation for that, but that's what I think it is. All right, so time date stamp, that can be different from um, what would actually be uh, in the file file header time date stamp. 
And then uh, there's number of functions, number of names. These could be theoretically different numbers, but in reality, this is they should be just the same. And these are going to be the total number of functions which are being exported by this module. So it's just saying, like, I have 10 functions which I export, and they're going to be in these arrays that we'll see next. Um, base has to do with when the programmer specifies that they want, you know, this function to be this or that ordinal, they don't have to start with ordinal 1, for instance. So they could say, like, my first ordinal is ordinal 10, and, like, this function is 10, and then this function is 11, and this function is 12. So they don't have to start from 1, and therefore this base actually turns out to be whatever the least possible ordinal is that they specified, this base has to be such that you subtract base from the ordinal number in order to get an index into an array that we're going to see in a second here. So there's going to be an array of function pointers. And if the programmer decided to say, well, my first function that I export is, I'm going to call it ordinal 10, if it's the first function exported, it could still be index 0 in this array of function pointers. And so the base is just to subtract, you know, base would be 10, the first thing's 10, so that 10 minus 10 is 0 to say that this is actually index 0 into this uh, function pointer array of exported functions. Yes? What would be the advantage of the uh, person actually choosing a high number like that? I'm not sure. Oh, I'm, I'm not really sure on that at all. I think because importing by ordinals, well, I don't know. All I can say is that importing by ordinals used to be the preferred method because they didn't used to sort their functions alphabetically. And therefore, back in the day, you'd have to do a full linear search over the entirety of the functions in order to find what you want. So they used to say, you know, let's just uh, import by ordinal. But, but since the base really only has to do with, since it can only really specify the initial offset from the first ordinal to zero, you know, you can still have gaps and stuff like that, but it's really just to pull down the first gap, I guess. I don't know. So say I don't know. Leave it at that. And if anyone seeing this later knows why, they should let me know. All right, so address of functions. This is the first of the arrays that, so there were those three arrays hanging off of the export directory. Uh, address of functions is the first one. The actual field address of functions in this export directory is an RVA which points at the beginning of an array. And each of the elements in that array is an RVA which holds the points to the beginning of a function. So it's an array of RVAs, basically. And this array that it points to should be number of functions long. So if there's going to be, you know, if number of functions is 10, this address of function should be pointing at the beginning of a 10D word array where each of those elements in the array is just pointing out at some other function. And specifically, the thing which is pointed to this address of functions, this array it points to, we're going to call that the export address table. So when I was talking about the import address table, we get those filled in function pointers. And we say that, you know, it searches for a specific name in the exports. This address of functions, this is giving you the RVA for a given uh, function. So when I go out and look for NT query system information in ntdll.dll, you know, if my module says, I want NT query system information, the OS loader needs to go out to NTDLL, finds its export directory, finds its address of functions, and then, you know, searches down. First, it'll try that hint. It'll, like, try index whatever the hint is. And if that doesn't turn out to be the actual name that it's looking for, then it has to search some more. But we'll see that more when we get to the picture here in a second. So the two other uh, tables that are hanging off of this export uh, directory. The first is the address of names. And so this, again, is an RVA which points at a table. And this table holds D word RVAs. And each of those RVAs points at strings, which are the names of the exported functions. So address of names, we're going to call the import names table, or sorry, export names table. And so it's basically like the address of functions is the export, function, uh, export address table. So it's like holds an array of addresses. And the address of names is the export names table. And that holds the addresses of a bunch of strings which correspond to those functions. And then the address of ordinals is basically a mapping between this function and the actual ordinal which uh, would be used to index into the address of functions. Which 
We'll see again in a second when I show the picture, and then we'll go back and say that again. All right. I'm going to go back to that as well. All right. So we start out. So now the difference here between uh, imports and exports. In imports, we saw before there's one of those uh, one of those descriptors per module that you import, right? You have to say, I want this module, and I want that module, and I want that module. Exports, it's only saying, here's the functions which I export. Therefore, there needs to only be one image export directory in the entire program, right? And the single export directory will have something like the name, which will say, you know, I am ACL edit DLL. And, you know, it's kind of redundant, but it's just, uh, just there for sanity checking, I would imagine. So it has a name. It has a time date stamp saying, I am ACL edit DLL. I have this time date stamp. This is, you know, the last time I've updated anything about my exports. And then we have, you know, the number of functions, number of names. That's just number of functions. Well, yeah, number of functions there, number of names there. And like I said, theoretically, they can be different. But in practice, they're going to be the same, same length. And then the address of functions. I said, this is the first thing we're going to call all of that around. We're going to call that the export address table. So what I said is in this export address table, I said, this is an RVA, which just points to the start of the table. And every entry in the table is an RVA, which points at a function. So these are just, you know, if you take the base address of ACL edit and you add it to this, that's the absolute virtual address of, you know, whatever function it is. On the other hand, now we have this export names table on the bottom. And it's just a bunch of RVAs which point at some strings. The strings are wherever else in the binary that they happen to be. But it's basically just saying, you know, this, at this offset into my binary is the string DLL main, right? At this offset into my binary is the string edit audit information info, right? So each of these is just, there's some big, you know, big blob of strings for the exports somewhere in my binary. And this export names table has offsets into the blob of strings saying that, you know, this index is that, uh, that string. Now, the names table, so the names table is used to make a mapping between, or sorry, the name of ordinals table is used to make a mapping between this entry in the names table and some entry in the export address table. So this, there's not like a one-to-one -one mapping here. It's not like, you know, if you find that the, if you're looking for edit permission info and you like, you search through and you find, okay, this index in ENT is edit permission info. You can't just say that index here goes to that index there. Because there can be reorderings, there can be gaps, there can be stuff like that. So what we actually have to do is when we find out that it's this index here, we'd say this is index you know, 0, 1, 2, 3. Index 3 there, and we go 0, 1, 2, 3. And we'd go, now take this value out of the names of ordinals and treat that as an index into the export address table. So this now we're saying, you know, go 0, 1, 2. And this is the actual address of edit permission info. This is the actual RVA to the function within this module. So it's sort of uh, one level removed. And so there's a couple reasons for this. Um, the first one is, nowadays, this table is sorted alphabetically, lexical, graphically, whatever. You can see that this is alphabetical right here down on the bottom. And the reason for that is that when you're trying to import by name, when all you have is you say, I want to find edit permission info, by having these sorted alphabetically, now we can do a binary search through this, right? So if they're all sorted alphabetically and I say, I want, you know, well, let's, what did I do in my example? I said, look for edit owner info. Okay. So here's edit owner info. Let's say that I'm the OS loader and I want to like find edit owner info like, where's that address within the function or within the module ACL edit.dll? So, if I'm doing a binary research and I pretend that this is, you know, just six large, and I assume that I go to the middle and then I go that way rather, you know, since there is no entry exactly in the middle, I can choose to go up or down. I'll say I choose to go up. So I go up and I take this RVA and I go there and I find, okay, so I start, I'm looking for edit owner info up there at the top. And I, so I go, you know, is E equal to E? Yes. Is D equal to D? Yes. Is I equal to I? Yes. Is T equal to T? Yes. Then I get here and I say, is P equal to O? Right? So is owner info. 
So O is less than P. So that means I've gone too far in my binary search, right? I've gone too far this way because O is less than P. So now I take, you know, I get rid of that and I go back down to this sub chunk of the array, right? I go to the middle of that and then I go here and I say, you know, okay, the edit matches up again, right? But then what eventually I get is A equal to O and I say no, it's less than O. So I've gone too far in this direction and so I go from here and now this is my only thing left and so I go here. I go down and this edit owner info will be correct. When I get there, right, I say, okay, I found edit owner info right here, this index into the import export names table. So it's index 0, 1, 2. And so I go, all right, I want to go 0, 1, 2 into the name ordinals table. And I pull that out and I say, okay, index 1 into the EAT. So I go 0, 1. And now this is the actual RVA for the function edit owner info in my module. So there's a couple things here. First of all, you can see this thing is not ordered, you know, numerically increasing, right? And the reason for that is because this is ordered alphabetically. But uh, there's no reason that these things actually have to be ordered alphabetically within the thing. Actually, see, E, D, yeah, no. So it's basically like when this module ACL edit got compiled, Zero right here happens to be this. If we go look at the actual implementation where these functions are within the module, we'll see that actually it goes edit info, edit, or sorry, edit audit info, edit owner info, edit permission, and then all of a sudden there's DLL main, right? So if I'm just looking linearly in this module, it turns out it went this one, that one, that one, and then this one, and then that one, that one, that one. So this is why this is uh, out of order basically, because in reality, DLL main is the third thing, basically. In, it's the third, uh, third actual implemented function in this module. And the other thing is we can see here there's a gap here. So it goes 0, 1, 2, 3. There is no 4. And then there's 5, 6. And so this could have to do with, for instance, uh, deprecation. Or it could be like I'm not actually exporting something anymore. I think yeah, same difference. You'd say if I'm deprecating a function like I'm not exporting it anymore, this export address table will still have, you know, an index 4, and there'll still be some RVA of a function there, but let's say I don't want anyone to start to use that anymore. So I say this function is deprecated, you may not use it anymore. And so by no longer exporting it, I can still keep the address table the same. So I don't have to change anything here, but by just getting it rid of it in the uh, name ordinals table and the uh, export names table, by just changing these, I can get rid of your ability to ask for this unless you ask specifically for ordinal 4. So uh, that's one way that you can like keep this the same so that, you know, someone can still potentially import, you know, the ordinal if they want or they can just import by name for anything which is still available by name. But by cr I can create that gap essentially without needing to update the time date stamp because uh, everything else will still the save the same, basically. The point is, like, if originally, you know, uh, whatever number 5 is here, if fm extension proc w was index 5 in the EAT before I got rid of this index 4, actually index 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, yeah, it was index 4. You know, if, if this thing happened to be index 5, in the table before I got rid of index 4, it's still index 5 after I get rid of index 4, right? So this doesn't change. That address is still correct. The OS, you know, any bound imports against that address are still correct. So if the linker went through and, you know, it took this address and it added it to the base address and it filled it in for whoever imported FM extension proc, nothing actually in that module would change because that address would still be correct. So I'm going to go backwards now and explain stuff once again, and then I'll come back to this picture and ask you questions on it again. All right. So, going backwards one more time. All right? Okay. I said time date stamp. This is the thing which is actually checked against when the bound imports are sanity checked, right? So the OS loader comes in and it says, is the time date stamp for my module still correct versus what was bound against? Base is just uh, if you happen to be, you know, exporting by ordinal and you give it some number greater than one, 
then the base needs to be greater than 1 so that you can subtract it and get an index into that export address table. Address of functions, that was that top array right there. We said it's just an RVA to an array of RVAs, each of which points to a function. Address of names, that was the bottom array, and it just points at strings, saying, you know, this, this is, you know, whatever string for the function which I'm exporting. An address of name ordinals, that has a mapping between the string table and the address table because there need not be a one-to-one -one mapping because the string table got ordered alphabetically, right? So it's because the string table got ordered alphabetically, that means there's not necessarily going to be a one-to-one -one mapping between this and that. And then the names table, is it is that mapping, basically. So what I just showed you was importing by name. So I said, if the OS is importing by name, it searches this table doing a binary search, trying to find the exact string that it's trying to import. When it finds that string, it takes whatever index is in here, uses the value in that index in here as an index into there. So you can see how importing by ordinal could be a lot faster because when I say import by ordinal, if my thing says I want ordinal or let's say, let's say that I know still that there's some function exported at ordinal 4. Literally all the OS loader has to do is it goes to this table, finds this, and goes 4, got it. Add it together, done. Right? So export, uh, importing by ordinals is, you know, much faster because there's no searching around for strings and stuff like that. And that's why I said previously, they didn't have these sorted. Previously, these were just in the order that they occurred in, and then, you know, there would be more of a one-to-one -one mapping there. But uh, that would also mean that they had to do a full linear search over the entire strings array in order to find anything. So uh, back in the day when they had to do a full linear search, you definitely wanted to import by ordinal because otherwise you'd waste a bunch of time at the beginning of your loaded executable trying to find all of the things you want to import. So anyways, um, because there's no searching around for strings and stuff like that. And that's why I said previously they didn't have these sorted. Previously these were just in the order that they occurred in and then, you know, there would be more of a one-to-one -one mapping there. But uh, that would also mean that they had to do a full linear search over the entire strings array in order to find anything. So uh, back in the day when they had to do a full linear search, you definitely wanted to import by ordinal because Otherwise, you'd waste a bunch of time at the beginning of your loaded executable trying to find all of the things you want to import. So anyways, um, that's how exports work. Let's see what else I have. A bit. Yeah. All right. Do I have any questions on the exports? We'll go look at some in P view in here in a second to see this. I mean, this is based entirely on the real values you'll see in ACL edit. But does anyone have any questions on how importing, ex well, how, how exporting by name works or how exporting by ordinal works and like how the interplay with importing works, right? So I'm sure you do, yes. So um, as far as the performance penalty for uh, importing by name as opposed to importing by ordinal goes, you only import a function once for any execution of a program. Right. right. So there's all this, you know, initial bootstrapping at the first execution, right? You double click on the thing, OS loader goes out and tries to find all your modules, tries to find all the functions that you import, right? By searching repeatedly over this thing for every given string that you happen to be importing by. But yes, it's just a one time, like, do everything up front, you know, unless it's delayed import, basically. So. You delay, if you delay import, you do it whenever you do it. But if it's a regular import, you do everything all at once at the very beginning. So, but yes, it's only a single time penalty. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, this is, yeah, this would be better answered off on this slide, but like, so we've been talking about importing and exporting in terms of how the loader does it. But when the loader actually imports a function into some program's address space, you know, is it actually going out and copying the, those, you know, that chunk of assembly that constitutes the function you're interested in and moving it? Or is it Functionally, yes. And uh, Bill, can we go over to the board? 
It's functional, yes, in the sense that it's not copying the assembly into, you know, say, Telnet's memory space. It's just loading the entire file for that, where whatever module you're importing from, it's loading that entire file into the memory space in RAM, right? And so it's putting this in memory, and then it's, you know, putting a pointer to that. So that code has to be implemented somewhere, right? And so if you're asking for, you know, NT query system information, there must be some code which implements that function. And so if you're asking for it, then the OS loader loads the entire DLL into memory, and then it just puts a pointer to that so that when you call it, it eventually calls to that code. So all the rest of the code is there that you're not calling, and therefore, you know, wasting space essentially. But, uh, but entire modules, everything you import, the entire module gets put into memory. Yes? So if you run two different processes, each importing the same module, does that module get imported twice in physical memory? If you, well, say the question again, but the answer is no. I'm trying to remember how you said it. Say it again. So if you load two processes, each with trying to load the same DLL, is that DLL going to be loaded twice in physical memory? Or is right. The page just going to be mapped into both? Right. So the question is, you know, if two processes ask for the same code, right? So here I have process A over here, and here I have process B. And let's say both of these are loading this shared library. I'm calling it shared library chunk one and two. But let's say that shared library was NT or ntdll.dll, right? What's going to happen is that for each of them, that code is going to be mapped somewhere into physical memory. So chunk one gets put here, chunk two gets put there in physical memory, wherever it gets put. But both of these things have the same mapping, right? So this one asks for NTDLL, and its virtual memory is pointing at one chunk in physical memory. This one also asks for NTDLL, and its virtual memory is pointing at the same chunk in physical memory, right? So there's no, there need not be duplication of, you know, wasting the RAM once per process, right? So each process, you know, the OS part of its job in terms of, you know, saving space and utilizing memory efficiently, part of its job is seeing where it can have the same data, the same data in physical memory mapped to potentially different virtual addresses and different process spaces, but ultimately it only wants one copy in physical RAM. There was something else I was going to say. Is that still the case even across different users? Is that the case across different users? I would say probably, depending on how the user switching is done and stuff like that, I'd say probably, but, you know, where, where you're thinking is in the notion of if I write into, you know, if I write into this, does that change show up in some other user? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, what an OS is going to do when it's doing some sort of sharing like this is it's going to implement a scheme called copy on write. So if process A tries to like literally, you know, write, write some data into NTDLL. Maybe they're trying to hook it with that, that non-IAT version of that DLL that I was talking about. If process A tries to write some data onto its copy of this thing, what the OS is going to do is say, I can see you're trying to write to something I've got shared, and potentially I have this shared amongst a, bu amongst a bunch of different processes, amongst different users, etc. So I don't want you to update that version which everybody else is seeing right now. So I'm going to copy this, put it right there, let you write that, and then I'm going to remap yours to the copy that you have right here. So that's called copy on write where the OS actually pulls off a copy to the side and it gives you a new copy, but everyone else can still share their version as long as they're not, um, as long as they're not writing to it. No, so your virtual address need not change. I'll get back to you on that on that question, Chris, but I don't think there's any succinct answer to it. Uh, your virtual address need not actually change. Your physical address will change. So your virtual address can still say the same as whatever that was. The OS just, you know, has some tables which map virtual to physical, right? Keeps the same virtual and maps it to a different physical. Yep, so you won't see any difference. You'll still be accessing the same exact address. It's just behind the scenes, the OS switches out a different chunk of physical memory. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll try, Chris, on, you know, a succinct definition of the import-export address. 
quick here and we'll see what I can come up with, but I don't think it's going to be succinct. Um, going back, I'll, I'll use this, this one picture that I used right here, basically. It'll probably be about the best I can do. So, you've got your executable which you're trying to run in the OS, wickedsweetapp.exe. When I double click on this executable, the OS, you know, takes the chunk, you know, takes the pieces of the disk, off disk, maps them into memory. That's this dotted line here where it maps it into memory. This is virtual memory. This is some file on disk. So it maps it into virtual memory. But then it looks and it says, oh, I see that you requested that I import mylib1, mylib2, mylib, you know, libc. It sees that you requested those because each of those things there that says import mylib1, mylib2, and libc, each of those things right there is what I'm calling a import descriptor. So this array right here of mylib1, mylib2, and libc, that is essentially this array of uh, import descriptors, right? So somewhere in a binary file, it says, I want mylib1, mylib2, and libc. But then the thing is, in each of those requests for importing these, right, there's going to be a pointer to a names table that says, here are the names of the things I want to import. Here are the uh, addresses of the things I want to import. And so that was sort of like this. Can you grab that door? So each of those descriptors had a pointer into some table where this table had a pointer to things like hint name, hint name, hint name. Now, when the OS is trying to go fill in these tables, so the point is on disk, those tables looked like this, right? They all, both the import names table and the import address table, both pointed at hint name, hint name, hint name, right? But I said that in memory, at load time, when the OS pulled in each of those things, the OS is now going to go and fill in each of these. And so then this is where the exports come into play. The OS loader is going to walk this list of names and it's going to say, all right, I see that you want X to release fast mutex and you say that it's ordinal one. So the OS is going to go to, in this case, you know, this line comes from hal.dll. It's going to go to hal.dll's exports table Right? It's saying, I want to import X released fast mutex. And so it's going to go to the export table of hal.dll. And it's saying, you know, I'm going to try, I'm going to try ordinal one first, but if that fails, then I'm going to just search for a string. So what the OS loader will do is, where did my exports table go? What the OS loader will do is, you know, pretend this is hal.dll. The OS loader will say, okay, well, I'm going to try, you know, index one, but, you know, it can't just go like that it, in, in reality since, you know, we know that these are not necessarily mapped to the names. What it would do is it would search through here and it would say, okay, you say that index one is actually 0, 1, 2 in this array. So I go 0, 1, 2 in this array. And then I check that string that immediately followed the hint, and I say, does this string equal that string? If so, okay, that was a good hint. I got the right thing to import. And therefore, you know, I just go back and I say, okay, index one, and I can go in and I can just go ahead and grab that address, take that, add it to the base address, and go fill it back into the table, right? So I would take this, you know, 4010, I'd add it to whatever the base address of hal.dll is, and well, I meaning the OS loader. The OS loader would grab that and take it and it would, you know, add those base to the RBA and it would fill it into this. And then it would go to the next one, try the next hint and check against the string, try the next hint and check against the string, etc. Let's say that, you know, hint one was not equal to the string that it wanted, right? So it says, okay, hint one should be X release fast mutex. So the OS loader goes down. And it goes in here, you know, it finds, okay, hint one is this one right here. It says, okay, this is not the same string that I'm looking for. Not the string you were looking for. So instead what it has to do is import by name. So now it says, okay, for the string I'm looking for, binary search this thing, blah, 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 find the string I'm looking for, 
use that to go into here, use here to go into that, take that address, add it to the base address, and go fill it back into the table, the import, import address table. Fill it in, right? So either the hint is correct and it found the export pretty much on the first try, or the hint is incorrect and it needs to just search the strings table for the string which is listed in the import names table. And eventually, the whole point is just get the real base address. Now, this is the real base address, not the image base in the structure header, uh, over to the board bill. This is not the image base in the P header. This is take the real base address where this module is actually loaded into memory and add the RVA to that and fill in this absolute virtual address in the import address table of the module which you're trying to, Im which is trying to import it. All right, so these are the real runtime base addresses. You need to take that address and add it to the RVA. And again, it's because those can move around that we're using RVAs in the first place, right? The reason we don't just have a bunch of hard-coded addresses is because this can move around and you just want to say whatever that happened to be at runtime, add the relative offset and get an absolute address for this module right now in this memory space and stick it into the table. I got it. Hey, thank All you right, very good. much. Okay. So again, any further questions about uh, the basics of imports and exports? Things like that. Anyone have any further questions they want to ask? Anything else about this? Yeah. Right. At the link time, right? So at, at link time, um, you know, the linker can know, okay, well, it's going to import, it, it wants to import this or that module, right? And it can go over and it can check the exports of the thing which it would be imported from at load time. <coughs> And can say, okay, it looks like you want, oh, going back up here, at link time, the linker can say, okay, it looks like you want X release fast mutex. And I'm going to go over and look at hal.dll and I'm going to check its exports table. Again, the hint is kind of like a speed hack, just like binding. It's filling that in at link time so that you can, the OS loader can potentially find it that much faster. All right, so time for a 10 minute break. And then we'll come back and talk about forwarded exports.